Hi there, everybody. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Uh, much of the work that I do is advisory in nature. I'm dealing with uh, CIOs and CXOs and talking about how do we make um, IT center stage uh, in the organization. And, and often there's an issue around the strategic relevance of IT. I think what we've heard today um, and the movement that I've only just discovered of you know, this API movement in general actually presents a way for the IT function to become uh, more strategically relevant. So I think it's a, it's a great thing. We're living in very interesting times in that technology has never evolved at such a fast rate. Soberingly, um, it will never ever be this slow again. Such is the nature of exponential growth. Organizations that are struggling today, organizations that are making a profit today, but operate on a 20th century business model, are facing extinction. They are entering the event horizon, the black hole. There's no turning back. My hypothesis that I'm covering today is that successful businesses need to embrace technology and technology evolution and macroeconomic trends, but they also need to embrace anthropological <coughs> trends as well. You might call it a kind of anthroeconomics. What I'm talking about has evolved over 200 million years. And I'm just conscious that I haven't got that much time, so I'll only go back 12,000 years in this respect. We'll work our way back to the present, where we'll look at the future, or we'll look at how the world of work, workers, and leadership is, uh, is changing. Then we'll have a little look into the near future to see what lies ahead. And I'll lay down some pillars on which I believe one needs to put in place to build a, an API-driven uh, business. So, going back 12,000 years, 12,000 years ago, we were chasing our lunch across the savannah. So we were highly mobile. We were highly social. If we weren't social, then there was a danger that lunch might eat us. We had to collaborate in terms of securing lunch. Our work and our life were highly integrated. If we haven't eaten for three days and some food appears on the horizon at five past six, we wouldn't say, no, I'll leave it till nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So we lived very integrated lives. Our productivity was judged on the number of meals secured, number of animals captured, number of berries picked, and so on. So our productivity measures were very, very clear. And we had to make decisions in real time, and we had to be highly creative. That's how it was in the era of the hunter-gatherer. Then along came the... Uh, agricultural era. We gathered by the oasis and we got a little less mobile, but we were still mobile in the sense that we had to go out and check the animals, we had to take the animals to market and so on. We were highly social, so it wasn't, you know, EDI, Edifact, uh, e-commerce type uh, transactions. You spent a lot of time talking to the people you were going to deal with, so trust was a large part of it. Highly, highly social. Work and life, again, were integrated. Uh, you know, animals don't give birth on a nine to five basis. So again, um, you know, farmers had to be on call all the time. Something very significant happened 200 years ago in that we had this thing called the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, our mobility stopped. We, we, we turned up at these factories. So we were no longer mobile. And our output was now judged on labor, our time. So our productivity was based on how long we stuck around for, in essence. Now that model of working encouraged us as workers to get the best return on, you know, on best return financially on time expended. So we developed the art of laziness. And in turn, organizations developed the art of management to stop us from being lazy. So these sort of concepts came around as a result of the industrial era. Now, of course, when we've been paid for our time, any talking, any socialising was frowned upon. So social was, uh, you know, a no-no. We weren't mobile. Most of us hated 
our job, whether it was in an actual factory or a furnished factory, sometimes called uh, an office. So we had this concept of work-life balance. I hate my work, but I look forward to the evening. I hate my life, but I look forward towards the end of it to this thing called uh, <laughs> retirement. So we have this concept of, uh, of work-life balance. And many of us go on holidays and we refuse to look at our emails because the company doesn't own us we're on holiday. But of course, this is setting us up for an absolute nightmare uh, when we get back. So this work-life balance thing doesn't seem to be working out so well. So now we're entering into this uh, digital economy. And some people would say that, well, you know, the digital economy is really just more tech, faster, uh, and so on, Internet of Things, augmented reality, etc. But I don't think it's that. I think the digital economy is mankind's return to his true nature. The technologies are enabling us to be social. They're enabling us to be mobile. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're enabling us to you know, live integrated lives. It is in our mammalian nature uh, to make decisions in real time. So the sort of analytics tools that are becoming available, it's all about our human nature here. Um, creativity is not something that happens in the R&D department or in some sandbox with ponytail wearing you know, funky guys. Everybody uh, wants to be creative. It's in our, it's in our nature. So, and now, increasingly, our productivity has been judged on our outputs, not on the time put in. So this concept of having to be around the office, this presenteeism of needing to be there to show you're putting the hours in, that's slowly going out the window. So the digital economy, for me, really is mankind's return to his true nature. The industrial era was, in fact, a blip in history, in anthropological history, where we were at our most disconnected. And as we can see, these technologies are setting us free. And corporations don't necessarily like that, particularly old school organizations. You know, they, 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 they stopped Facebook coming into the organization. They stopped LinkedIn. If you left the organization, somebody would go into your LinkedIn account and remove those contacts because they were owned by the company, so to speak. You know, we've moved, we're moving quite fast. And we're going to move even faster because actually the power lies with the people. The power lies with the talent, so to speak. And that's driving the corporate agenda. And we, I guess, after you know, providing the services to those organizations, we have to wake up to that reality. Now, this kind of, you know, think of it as a Zen diagram, perhaps. Um, but essentially, what I'm trying to say here is that the world is um, exponential. The technology evolution is exponential. We have long periods of where there doesn't seem to be kind of any increase. You know, as soon as man got a stone and thought, right, I can do something with this, that's when we started to become augmented. Uh, it started to get quite significant around the industrial era, and it's now getting very fast, and it's just going to get even faster. So that's a reality we have to come to terms with. So uh, looking at the future, or actually looking at the present of work in many respects, I mean, this is a slightly dystopian picture, but what I'm trying to say here, it's not necessarily a case that we're all going to be turning up to the office on a regular basis. Cost and agility. Cost seems to be a theme of economic downturns. When there's an economic upturn, all of a sudden we're innovative again. But, you know, we live in a world, as we will see, where um, cost has to be the focus at all time. Agility is a fashionable word, but what good is agility when the lion is already on top of you? You can be responsive, but basically you're stuffed. Anticipatory is what we need to be. We need to be able to see what lies ahead, whether it's a threat or opportunity. So, you know, keep it, keep it in mind. Agility is important, and agility is certainly better than paralyzed. Uh, but anticipatory really is where we um, need to get to. And this agility um, comes in the form of having sensors using our senses, seeing what's out there, living and operating in real time. Living and operating in real time essentially means the death of strategy. Anybody who writes a plan that's a year, two years in advance, it's a novel, you know, as soon as it's written. <coughs> essentially, we've got to respond as the market ebbs and flows. 
basically strategy is, 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 is something that happens in real time and starts to blur a little bit in terms of the difference between strategy and tactics. Collaborative consumption. How many of you are aware of collaborative consumption? Not, not many, about two or three. Well, essentially, this can be thought of as a type of frugal capitalism. I've got a spare room, and in this, you know, the, the, perhaps economic times, I need to sweat some value from that room. So I rent it out to people. I've got places in my car. So I can, uh, you know, basically rent out seats to people. Now, some could argue in the extreme that this is simply peer-to-peer online exchanges in effect. But collaborative consumption, I think, has a frugal aspect to it, has a social aspect to it, so there tends to be consumers uh, involved in it. And um, in essence, it's, it's taking assets that you have and providing them as a service to other people that need access to those assets. So obviously things like Airbnb, uh, share your car, borrow my doggy is a good example. So there are people out there that own these things called doggies. And there are people out there that would like to walk them. Perhaps they don't, can't have a dog because they live in an apartment where the rules are such. So now that it's, you know, we have the uh, opportunity to, to sweat your pet, so to speak. So that's really what we're talking about here in terms of collaborative consumption. Taking things that are underutilized and actually uh, turning them into value. Whether that's driven by poor overall economic decisions or not, it's a reality, and collaborative consumption uh, as a model provides a great opportunity in terms of new business models. Reverse innovation. Reverse innovation. Um, essentially, this is, in many respects, potentially the last days of the, the Roman Empire, so to speak. You've got companies that are operating in Africa, India, China, and they're developing a model that works in a povertized economy. You know, maybe it's a sub-$1,000 house or sub-$100 uh, laptop, whatever it is. But the point is, once they've cracked the code on that model, they're bringing it west. And we won't be able to compete on costs. So if your business model is reliant on cost-sensitive customers, you have a problem. We've got to turn our cost-sensitive customers into raving price-insensitive fans. That's the only way you're going to um, survive this tsunami of uh, emerging economy entrepreneurs who are coming to eat our lunch. Creativity is, of course, very, very uh, important. And as I've said, this is something that can't just be constrained to a corner of the building. We're all, we've all got to be in the creativity business. If we're not in the creativity business, we're in the process business. We are a cog in the machine. If we're a cog in the machine, we'll be replaced by some software or a robot. So we need it for our own survival to be creative, to bring something to the table that a piece of technology cannot. And creativity also, in this world of the Internet of Things, we need to think about the dark assets in the organization. So, for example, in the supermarket, the trolley. What if we put a bit of software on that trolley? All of a sudden now, we can use this dark asset to uh, control our supply chain much more effectively and reverse this odd um, setup we have whereby we reward the worst shoppers. So you've only got a small basket, use the fast lane. You spent a lot of money with us, queue with the rest of them. So, you know, that's just an example, hospital beds, or you go to a restaurant, for example, and you've got, you know, you go to a restaurant and they say the cutlery is integrated with my fitness pal, so your knife and fork are on two magnetic plates. So these now control the velocity at which you can eat and the amount you can have on each fork. Wonderful for some people. How many of you got homework sent back to you with naught out of 10, well done. Approximately zero. We are educated to succeed. We are educated to be successful. In essence, we fear failure. And the fear of failure causes us to be very conservative, causes us to tend towards the status quo. That's a problem. We're not learning if we're not failing. <coughs> Culturally, that's a real problem, particularly in organizations that are, you know, let's say obsessed with operational efficiency. You're a cog, you're in the machine, you do that process day in, day out. There is no room for creativity. 
that's a serious problem, and that's a problem that established organisations have. Blurring boundaries. The boundary between the IT function and the user community is starting to blur. The boundary between the organisation and the rest of the market is starting to blur. So crowdsourcing is a good example of that. We are, you know, a lot of the best expertise in your organisation will increasingly come from outside the organisation. Imagine we're having a, a social chat, so to speak, on the enterprise network. A topic comes up that we don't understand. Uh, the enterprise software searches uh, the yellow pages of the organization and discovers actually there's nobody in the organization that has that expertise. So now the software goes and searches your social networks. So actually the value that you bring to work is not just you with your CV, it's your social connections as well. That's going to be a big change. Asymmetric business models. The majority of the people that fly on an, an Orion Air plane are being subsidised by one or two people on that plane. Google, the majority of Google's customers get it for free and a handful of Google's customers pay. So this asymmetric business model, where things that you perhaps value today and charge a high margin for, are going to be things that eventually you give away for free because it's all about marketing, it's all about viral marketing, and you've got to get it out there in order to be, for people to know that you exist. Steve Barmer once said that our software has been heavily pirated in China, and we must keep it that way, because it's all about getting your name out there at almost whatever the cost. So, n now looking at the, um, the way the, the, the worker is changing. <coughs> I believe that uh, we're seeing a change from suit-wearing process cog uh, to artist, to somebody who is genuinely creative and is striving to be the best in the world. The issue is not for your kids to be the best in the class, it's to be the best in the world. And we need to ask ourselves the question in a global economy, what is it that I'm the best in the world at? Now, all of a sudden, careers move from being a thing to pay the bills to what is your purpose in life. And your life then becomes a path to mastery. So we will increasingly see, let's say, artists in the organisation. If we take the banks, for example, the banks are on a race to the bottom. They're using technology. They're turning the, tech, the, the, the banks into factories. There will come a point when there are no people in the banks and they're operating at approximately zero margin. They will then think to themselves, right, what do we do here? Well, OK, let's start reintroducing people. Uh, but these people are going to be highly creative people. Think Salvador Dali, Lady Gaga, Andy Warhol, Picasso. A nightmare from a HR perspective, but highly creative. So that's the, that's the workforce of the future. And young people, I think, are in particular, are looking at life and they're saying, right, I, I, I don't want to be driven by having the flashiest car, the biggest house and the most expensive holidays. I'm going to descale my material requirements and that's going to give me more options in terms of careers I pursue. So like the hunter-gatherer, I might take that berry or I might go after that rabbit there's an abundance. Once you're not hamstrung by economic necessity, golden handcuffs, you have choices. And we're seeing young people make those choices, and that makes it very difficult for employers to just wave money carrots. Gladwell talked about in his book Outliers the need for work to be meaningful, uh, the need for work to be challenging, and for there a need to be a correlation between output and payment. So this is a move, this is a kind of post-labour model so to speak. I've mentioned this race to the bottom. There's also a, a power shift. There's not enough talent on the planet. So it's great if you are talent. It's great if you have a talent, you have competence. It's great if you have passion. And it's great if there's a demand. You need all three. Paolo talked about BYOX. Well, BYOF. So, young graduate in the city being interviewed for a, a banking job. All going very well. And then the interviewer said, um, let's now talk about salaries. And the young graduate says, dad, in you come. Start negotiating. So bring your own father. 
that's happening. And that's, you know, it's a little frivolous as a description, but as the economy, as, as the demographics get older and our parents perhaps, let's say, have Alzheimer's, you will be bringing your own family to work in the same way as people brought their kids to the creche. And if your employer cannot look after your parents uh, while you get on with some work, then they don't get you. And because you're the best in the world, that's what they have to accommodate. And it's all very well having Lady Gaga, et cetera, um, around the organization, but we need them to cooperate. We need them to collaborate. So this concept of a collective consciousness, collaboration, social media, in my view, is a subset of collaboration. So it's all about taking the brains of your organization and the, the, and the organization that can make the best super brain is the one that wins. So, um, Let's look at um, leadership now. The carrot and stick model doesn't work. The command and control model doesn't work because that's, you know, that's simply far too uh, slow. If I'm a worker and I'm the best in the world, I don't need any motivation. I don't need a manager leaning over me. I'm more motivated than they are. I'm only as good as my current gig. If I screw up, that's my reputation gone in the social economy. So I don't need any management. So the challenge we have here is if you're a manager, what do you do? The only two types of people that will be needed will be leaders and talent, people that can do things. So that's going to have a serious impact on organizations, how they structure themselves. And this involves something called trust. You're going to have to start trusting people to get on with the job and do the job well. But in, a, in the social, if you like, reputation economy, that shouldn't be an issue. Apps. Apps are these things that were perhaps uh, developed by the digital marketing department. Now, increasingly, they are at the center of business strategy. And we all only have this little kind of square icon in terms of, uh, you know, uh, user device real estate, uh, so we're having to get smarter and smarter in terms of how we build a strategy or a, a, a business model around this little thing. How many of you have come across the concept of the jagged resume? Okay, none. Um, in the perfect scenario, you would have... Um, Somebody that you know, you'd look at their CV and they've been to MIT, Harvard, Oxford, etc., etc., and they maybe even have a certain eye color and height and so on. That's when you've got an abundance economy in terms of talent, but there's not enough good talent out there. So we're going to have to get a bit more lateral in terms of acquiring the talent. So picture this scenario whereby the recruiter gives to the CEO this CV, and the CEO looks at the CV and says, Well, yeah, that's okay. Um, but he's um, hmm, spent some time in prison. And the recruiter says, yes, uh, but he ran a gang. And a very successful gang at that. And the CEO, the CEO thinks to himself, well, actually, we're setting an office up in the Ukraine. We need somebody who's a bit tasty. <laughs> there you go. So what we're going to see is people uh, being judged not just on their academic, their work experience, but on their social network and their real life experiences. And the skill of HR will be to kind of, how can we tap that? How can we make use of it? And a bit like star, you know, Premier League football teams, the strategy doesn't come from the top down. You build it around the players. So essentially, strategy will not be created in the boardroom. You will look at the key talent that you have and decide based on that talent how you go about your business. And if you lose some of that key talent, then you've got to go off in a different direction. Basically, the power is with the talent. And that's why it's so important for us to be talented and for our kids to be talented and for our education system to churn out talented people, not just more cogs for the factory. So, looking at this um, notion of hunter-gatherer, I guess Gartner would, would call these digital natives. So these are people that just expect technology. Unlike perhaps our parents, one employer, um, one career, they are going to just do 
a lot of different things. There might be a common theme of helping people, there might be a common theme of being an entertainer or being a scientist, but they will probably hop from job to job, from gig to gig. Not necessarily doing it because of the money, uh, they're doing it uh, because of the experience that they're gaining. And as I've mentioned, they see this as a path to mastery. And that's a big challenge for um, universities. Are, you know, they become quite costly. Are they actually offering value? Would you not be better off getting into an apprenticeship in some capacity, like in the pre-industrial eras, and do your kind of apprenticeship journeyman master, if you like, um, career building? These uh, millennials, these hunter-gatherers will be highly mobile, so we need to provide, if you like, corporate infrastructures that enable them to be mobile, that enable them to be able to operate while they're on the move, so to speak. And, of course, they're, they're highly social. They know they're going to be working later into the day, so they don't want to have work-life balance. They want work and life integrated. They want to be able to go about their social activities during the day. And by the same token, in the middle of the night, if they come up with a creative solution to a business problem, they will have no problem spending time on it. Because again, it's all to do with the output. And from the uh, hunter-gatherer's perspective, the digital hunter-gatherer's perspective, it's all about doing great work and, if you like, uh, moving along that path to mastery much like a, a, you know, a chess player or a, or a martial artist. And yes, they'll be seeking meaningful work. So if your organisation specialises in helping young children accelerate their path to type 2 diabetes, because you're a confectionery organisation, that's going to be quite a challenge. So organisations are going to have to think about their own values in order to attract people that have similar values. And as I say, they will be economically optimised. This frugal economy will allow them uh, to not be so reliant on getting big salaries. They'll be able to acquire big salaries because they're the best in the world, but that won't be what's driving them. They've looked at their parents, and it's a bit like watching, um, I don't know, people in a, in, a, in a psychiatric unit wandering around the courtyard, and all of a sudden they want to escape. So they climb up this greasy flagpole. They believe the higher they get, the greater their chances of getting out of the, uh, of the unit. But as we know, many of us climb the greasy pole only to fall off. And those of us that don't fall off get to the top and realise, actually, we're still in the psychiatric unit. And young people are looking at their parents and thinking, my parents have got the toys, they've got all the marks of uh, success, but they've never had any real time to enjoy it. They've gone around in a kind of state of being kind of not quite in the moment, so to speak. And young people are taking a, a slightly different view in terms of what their priorities are. So they're not necessarily going after the, the, the brands, so to speak. And this kind of frugal capitalism, which I keep coming back to, it's kind of becoming fashionable, and that's a problem when, you know, perhaps what you sell is at the, the luxury end of the market. Ultimately, um, these people work uh, to give their lives meaning, not to pay the bills. But, of course, people do have to pay the bills. OK, so... Um, we live in a world now that if we're going to attract the talent, we're going to retain the talent. We need to take into account the fact uh, that the services we provide need to, if you like, enable uh, the workers to be social, to be mobile, to be productive, to have work life integrated, to be creative, and to make decisions. So this is very, very important. The name of the game is to turn data into information, that's the job of the computer, or data into insights even, to take those insights and pass them through the heads, through collaboration of the people, and that turns insights into wisdom. And then if they act on that wisdom, they, that wisdom becomes customer experience, positive customer experience. So we need APIs for all of those three levels. So what we're starting to see is that a lot of the APIs we're developing, a lot of the tools that we're developing, a lot of the wearables, etc., 
are in essence augmenting our senses. They are making us uh, better humans, faster, higher, stronger, smarter, uh, and so on. So that's really where we're going uh, with this. So I believe that we need to look at the past in order to see the future. If we look at the internet, chapter one was the internet of people. The internet enabled people to communicate. Then chapter two, we're seeing the internet of things. I believe the next chapter is the internet of things in people. So wearables start to become embeddables. So we start to augment ourselves. That's quite a big step. In parallel, we're seeing the, the, the rise of robotics, so to speak. And I've been to, I, I went to an event where a minister talked about taxing organizations that used robots in order to discourage them, in order to keep people employed. Now that's not sustainable, particularly when you operate in a global economy. So there's this concern that the robots will take our jobs. But I don't see this as a tremendous issue because the reality is we'll probably be those robots. Kind of, you know, half cyborg, half human. And that might seem strange, but I think we're kind of getting there. You know, if you leave home and you haven't got your mobile phone, you in some way or other feel naked or vulnerable or not quite right. We're already augmented. Okay, next step, uh, smart watches. So these, that, you know, that's fundamentally for people that are too lazy to take the mobile phone out of their pocket. <laughs> but the next step beyond that, for people that can't be bothered to turn their wrist, is to have it straight to the head, so to speak. And this is already provable. Graphene, atomic, nanotechnology uh, already enables us to have biosensors uh, in, in the brain. So we're, we're there from a technology perspective. And you imagine walking down the road and you see someone you know and you want to say something smart, uh, you know, just to show that you're kind of urbane and hip and so on. Um, well, you can get your mobile phone out and check their LinkedIn profile and do a little bit of Wikipedia action, um, but wouldn't it be easier if that was just integrated straight into your head? That's, that's fundamentally where it's going to end up, so to speak. And that sort of takes us into a whole almost different species. But that transition, I would say, started the time that we first picked up the stone. So the world is changing. This augmented person is our customer, is our supplier, is our employee, is our colleague. It's us is the reality. And so organizations that build their business strategy or, or business model, I should say, with APIs that support sociality, mobility, work-life integration, creativity, uh, productivity, and decision-making, if you do that, nature itself will be your business partner. I believe that APIs are the glue that hold are going to hold and are holding digital society together. And you guys are the guys that are building this digital society. So over to you. Thank you. So I've got a mic here. Does anybody have a question? If anybody has a question, yes, hold on. I was wondering what type of car you would drive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what, this given, given your views, you know, what type of car would you drive? I kind of picture something between a, uh, a Volkswagen Beetle but with a bazooka on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, um, I guess driverless cars are on their way and the legislation is kind of in place for that. And you might say driverless cars is a kind of IP version of the railway system. So it's essentially the railway system to your doorstep where basically cars are little IP information or traveling packets. So I think, I'm not, not sure that's what you were <laughs> looking to get from the, the answer, but that's me on driverless cars. So I have a question. Sure. Uh, you talked about people being the best that they could be, right? And as a result of that, you talked about um, possibly only having kind of two roles, uh, the leader and then the talent. So 
What happens if you're somebody that is in IT and you're building what was those traditional legacy horrible systems that Palo and, and the like talked about? Do you convert into being talent, or what's that look like for you? Well, I mean, looking after legacy systems, COBOL-based systems, is a talent. And ultimately, you know, if you take this sort of Venn diagram of um, competence, passion, and market demand, if there is no market demand, what you've got is a, a hobby. If there's market demand and competence, but you're not passionate, you're a necessary evil in effect. So the point is that if there is a demand for COBOL people and that uh, the supply uh, or the demand outstrips the supply, I would certainly stick with it uh, because there's, there's money to be made and uh, you know, potentially there's, there's good work to be done as well. Um, I'm surprised that these systems have lasted as long as they've lasted. But I guess with a kind of SOA model, you can kind of just put a wrapper around it and call it a rather large object and deal with it. But the chances are organizations like that and banks come to mind, uh, they are so um, arthritic in their, in their design that they're going to have to build a 2.0 version of themselves anyway. So essentially you, you run that car until it you know, hits the wall, so to speak, and it might run for another six months, it might run for another six years, but all organizations, particularly ones based on a 20th century business model, need to be building their, their 2.0. So it's coming back, my, my <laughs> My advance to somebody that's getting into COBOL or stuck in COBOL, let's say, um, well, you know, it, it, depending on what your driver is, and if your driver's money, it's a great place to be. Uh, but of course, if it's um, not, then perhaps develop some of the, uh, the API skills and take them uh, to the market. Excellent. I hope you'll join us for cocktails. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Abe. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.